Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Vikas Pota. I am in London, the UK today. Uh, we are experiencing a heat wave. And so please forgive this transmission if it's interrupted. And you know, Wi-Fi often cuts out when you have good weather or bad weather. Um, today, I am fortunate to bring someone who, I, um, who I've known for a couple of years, um, a gentleman called Daniel Ansari to this conversation. Um, Professor Ansari uh, is known to me because um, a few years ago I used to organize the Global Education and Skills Forum in Dubai where the Jacobs Foundation from Switzerland have this fabulous program of working with researchers in, in diverse areas that look at learning sciences and we wanted to see the application of uh, latest research uh, and link it up with teachers and K-12 school systems and we undertook a program of work together uh, that actually um, you know, went into depth uh, with that. And uh, Professor Ansari was one of the individuals that came and, um, and I really enjoyed keeping in touch with him. Uh, I thought that Daniel, uh, welcome to this live stream. And what I thought was we should talk about this area that often does get mentioned, but I suspect no one really understands. Um, you know, and, and it's a, these are big words, but you being a, 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 you know, a specialist in psychology, in education, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know, neuroscience in education. Welcome to the live stream, over to you. Thank you very much, Vikas. Uh, pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. What is the role of neuroscience in education? I think neuroscience is one of many scientific disciplines that has the potential to tell us more about how we learn. How do we understand? How do we develop? And I think that's really its role, is providing us with knowledge. And then we need to work hard to translate that knowledge. But neuroscience alone is not uh, some kind of magical discipline. It needs to be integrated with all sorts of other fields, psychology, because in the end, what we try to do as researchers and also as teachers is to explain how children behave. And for that, we also need to study behavior, not just the brain itself, but the brain, of course, supports behavior. So we need to have some rudimentary understanding of the brain. I think that is the role of neuroscience in education. And so what is it that we're learning? Well, I think uh, we've learned uh, some really important things uh, from the study of the brain. We've learned that uh, brain development is much longer than we used to think. Uh, we now know that even by uh, 18 years of age, our brains have not been fully uh, developed. We also know that our brains are very plastic. That means they change in response to experience. So when teachers teach in the classroom, they're literally orchestrators of brain plasticity. That's what we call it. It's, it's the ability of the brain to change in response to experience. We've learned that. We've learned about the importance of sleep, of exercise, uh, for how the brain functions. From a psychological point of view, we've got some principles on how to best structure a lesson, on how to best retain information. So there's a lot of pieces of information. And then we are better understanding the building blocks of the fundamental subjects, your reading, your math, uh, your science learning. We're starting to unpack what underpins those important core subjects and how we might be able to facilitate them better from an early age. And so when you look at that, uh, Daniel, I mean, you, you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, we're beginning to learn things. And I know that this is a specific area of interest to you in terms of numerical and mathematical skills. As someone who ran away from mathematics myself, um, you know, what do we know about how you build this into kids? Yeah, I, I think we already know. Please carry on. Please carry on. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we know quite a lot now about the building blocks of children's uh, mathematical skills. One thing that we know is that children come into the classroom with lots of intuitions about quantity, about space, uh, and those intuitions are where we can, where we can harness their, their intuitions and transform them into more formal skills. One of the things that my research is showing is that what's really important is that children start to understand from an early age the connection between a symbol, so it could be a number word, let's say three, and a set of three objects. Making that connection is fundamental. And that really allows them to build more formal understanding of math. So working with symbols is really important. Making the transition from concrete objects to abstract representations in their minds, because mathematics is extremely abstract, but it has concrete origins. 
So we've consistently found that symbol learning is really important. We also understand that children can develop emotional reactions to math from an early age. So we need to create environments in which uh, they don't develop mathematics anxiety and, and uh, run away from math, as you said. And so I look at this from a parent's perspective. I understand what you're saying about um, sim the use of symbols. Um, you know, are there one, two, three things that a parent can do to make sure that their child, um, you know, has an interest in numeracy and mathematics in particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's it's actually quite simple, and it's it's similar to the advice that parents get for reading. It's uh, it's it's try to make math something that you do every day. So. For example, if you have a four-year-old, buy yourself a game of snakes and ladders or rockets and comets, I think it's called in the UK, uh, which has been shown to be effective for teaching children about number of quantity relationships. Talk about math every day, uh, count out things together, compare quantities, uh, talk about length, height, width, spatial dimensions. Uh, get that language into the child's mind so that they understand that language later on when it comes to school. I think those are some simple activities. Point out quantities, you know, how many things do you see out there? How many shopping carts do you think there are in the supermarket? These kinds of simple conversations, I think, can get a child attending to quantity in the environment around them. Thank you for that. Um, you know, what you say makes a lot of sense, and obviously a lot of that happens. But yeah. yet we're seeing numeracy and literacy, um, you know, really struggle in terms of uh, the achievement of. Um, and it's often struck me as even cultures that do do, uh, you know, to promote exactly what you're doing, which is count and, and take into um, account every day, um, you know, various numerical uh, things. Um, they still also don't seem to be making that same headway. I mean, do you have a theory as to why it just doesn't work at the pace that, you know, we want it to? Yeah, I, I would say there, there's always two things to, to development. There's the environment, so your parents, uh, your, the kind of place that you grow up in, the school that you have. But there's also biology, and biology places constraints on us. And, you know, we all vary along uh, dimensions in multiple ways. You know, somebody may be very good at math, but not so good at reading or the other way around, or somebody may be very fast run and another person is not so fast. These things happen. So we need to take that into account that we have individual differences and that not every child is ne necessarily going to be excelling at math, but we can put things in place in the environment to at least reduce the gap between those that are not performing so well and those that aren't. I think the other thing that we need to remember is that really, um, Reading and math are not natural uh, to, to us. The, the, the basic intuitions are about language, the basic intuitions about quantities and space, but the formal systems that we've developed over the course of cultural history, you know, our, 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 our reading systems, uh, both alphabetical, non-alphabetical, but also our symbolic systems are relatively recent. And every single child's brain has to learn these uh, these symbolic representations uh, with which it was not born. So there is there is a tremendous struggle there, and it's. In, I mean, if we think about it, every time we send children to school, we kind of recapitulate human cultural history within them, and their brains need to change in order to do that. And for some children, that's more difficult than for others. And some teaching systems are more based in what we know about how children learn than others. I think it's it's a complex multitude of factors that explain sort of why some systems struggle uh, with, with their math and reading teaching and others, others excel. So I was re recently reading a, a blog about um, evidence-based approaches. Um, do, you wanna, uh, do you wanna speak a little bit, do you wanna speak a little bit about what an evidence-based approach is um, so that we can build on this conversation for this live stream? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, I, I like to think about it more of an evidence-informed approach. So, you know, for example, if you are um, a grade one teacher and you're trying to uh, choose some materials for your classroom, you're gonna go on to you know, if you go onto Pinterest and things like that and look at what other teachers are using, that might be useful. But I think in, in addition to that, 
you should try or in collaboration with the researcher should try to identify whether there is any evidence in support of using this particular approach to teaching, let's say, addition and subtraction. And that involves doing some literature research and seeing what's been published and seeing uh, whether there has been any kind of evaluation of this particular tool. I think an evidence-informed approach also takes a, a broader sort of macro approach to looking at the school uh, as, as, a, as an institution and what sort of things can we do in the school to facilitate learning? What does the timetable look like? What do we know about the most effective ways of learning? How much recess uh, time do children need according to research? So it sort of feeds into all of the different domains. How do I interact uh, with parents? How, do, how much do I integrate parents into the school work? Um, uh, what are the benefits of, of frequent examination or not? So I think for most questions that research can provide some guidance. It's not as though research provides a recipe that you then carry out because you still need at the core of it, you still need the competent teacher, the teacher that has solid intuitions that they build through a life of or, uh, you know, years of practice but the evidence can constrain and maybe push along the entire system in, in multiple ways. So, um, so um, we, we have a we number of teachers on here today, today. and what and would we, what would we, what we pay would is the number one, number one uh, way that uh, kids learn? That kids, sorry, I, forgot, I didn't get the last part. That kids learn. The number one thing in which way kids learn. I think it depends a little bit on the age. If you look at very young children, kids learn through play. We know that, that's very well established. And so what is now become clear is that young children, uh, when they're in kindergarten, need to learn through play, but need to also have some intentional guidance from their teacher. So it's not free play. Their play needs to be structured and encouraged in certain ways. And then as they go on, they learn increasingly more independently. And so there needs to be ways for uh, fostering their independent learning, but still directing them. So I think those are some fundamentals uh, that we know about how children learn. We also know a lot about how children um, uh, get knowledge into their brains. And that's not through cramming, that's through spaced learning, through having a little bit of math and a little bit of reading and going back to the math, that sort of thing. We also know that you know, rehearsing for an exam the night before is not going to work. You need to do that over a sustained period of time. So there are some real principles that apply across different disciplines about how children learn uh, that I think are, are incredibly rich and useful and, and sometimes very simple to apply, especially things like spacing learning or frequently recalling information that you've encoded. Uh, those can be integrated very easily into the classroom. I remember a conversation I was having with um, with Simon Sommer of the J Jacobs Foundation, and I posed this question to him in terms of what you know, uh, what are the the ten things that you know we need to know about how kids learn, and he he talked about number one for a very long time um, because of its importance in his in his thinking at least, and certainly chimed with me. Um, do you want to have a guess at what he said? One, I, I I don't know. Uh, I I wouldn't know what he what he would have said. Uh, no, he, say, he said taking notes. Taking notes. Yes. Yeah. As a, as a yeah. way of memory recall. Yes, absolutely. And uh, of course, there there are different ways of taking notes as well, right? I'm not totally familiar with that research, but that would be a great example, for example, of how to do an evidence informed approach, right? You have no. this intuition that taking notes, let's say, for your for your grade eight English class is a great way of learning. So, okay, then you go into the literature and you say, what do we know about note taking? What's the most efficient way? Should I take notes in this way or that way? Right, and that's, those are really simple ways in which evidence I think can constrain the way in which you teach and the way in which you guide your students. So, you wrote about, it's equally important to know what doesn't, uh, it's equally important to know what doesn't work. I think your your blog said. Yeah. Um, so I I know that there's a bunch of trends that teachers follow. Um, you know, what would you include in that list of things that have been proven not to work, in your opinion? I mean, well, one of the, not, not even in your opinion, but what does the research say? 
that doesn't yeah work. exactly yeah I don't know. um not my personal opinion but what i know from the from the evidence is that you know the concept for example of learning styles that you have auditory kinesthetic learners uh, that you have visual learners that concept uh, what, although you could ask me what kind of learner are you? And I might have a preference. Uh, however, the research has not shown that teaching to that preferent, preferred learning style is really gonna, gonna work. So uh, that's, I think, a really important one because that's still in many teacher training materials that I've seen, not just uh, here in Canada, but also in other countries, uh, despite years of evidence showing that it's not efficacious. And I think it's really important to look at that because one thing that we do know from neuroscience is that the regions of the brain that are really involved in our high level thinking and our reasoning and our, and our abilities to make analogies, those regions receive inputs from all sensory uh, modalities. So they're multi-sensory and, and therefore the, the, the whole concept of learning starts also doesn't make a lot of sense from a brain perspective. There are others I think that have been overemphasized. I would say the mindset theory is one of them. The idea that there are students who have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset, very attractive uh, theory that has made its way not just into schools, but into athletics, into management has been very impactful. Mindset does matter, but it matters to a very small degree. So it's not as though if you change a student's mindset, you're suddenly going to, you know, their, their learning is going to explode. That's what the early research suggested, but the later research doesn't uh, really go along with that. There's many more, you know, there's the idea of brain gym. There's the idea of left brain versus right brain. These are all so-called neuromyths that seem to be very intuitive and very prevalent. I see them all the time. Um, but unfortunately, the evidence is just not there to back them up. But instead, we do have a lot of other things uh, from evidence that we think are worth applying. So I think it's useful to exchange some of these uh, very persistent neuromyths with more updated uh, evidence. And yes, I do think it is just as important to know what works uh, as it is to know what doesn't work or what doesn't have a very strong evidence base, because then you can really use your time effectively, right? And so where would one go to find out what does work? That's a very good question. So I think one of the uh, one of the wonderful sites is the um, in the US would be the Institute of Education Sciences What Works Clearinghouse. Um, that is a very stringent database. You can only get in there if you've conducted what's called a randomized control trial, which is a very large experiment using lots of classrooms, lots of schools, random assignment to treatment and intervention condition. Um, but, you know, if you're in the UK, for example, uh, or even if you're not in the UK, you know, look at the Educational Endowment Foundation, the Nuffield Foundation, these are places where, uh, you know, research is really being done to evaluate the efficacy of projects. Uh, so th th those would be some of my first uh, ports of call. Um, I, I would also look at, you know, uh, resources like you mentioned the bold blog from the Jacobs Foundation. There's a lot of useful uh, sharing happening there. I think sharing of good evidence informed resources is really increased over the years and of course facilitated by the internet as well. Um, so uh, when I look at um, uh, at least two of the things you've mentioned, which are the research on learning styles and the work on growth mindset, um, they have taken root in education systems where a lot of teachers do follow these um, these theories and they do repose confidence in them. Now, I understand what you're saying in terms of what evidence-informed research uh, is, is doing, but how, uh, where, these, where theories actually emanate? Um, you know, do, do the original authors and researchers come back and say, actually, we may have got it wrong. Yeah, I, to some degree, I think I think there's there's some acknowledgement. I think it's sometimes very hard for scientists to walk back a big claim. Um, science has changed a lot too over the you know over the last twenty years or so, and is continually changing. So that's that's an important thing to know about evidence informed approaches as well. They're not set in stone, right? They they need to be uh, agile um, and adaptive to what we're learning, because we are also just as scientists continually learning. That's really our journey. is is one of, of 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 basically disproving our own theories in the hope of finding better answers that get us closer to the truth. So, 
with the learning styles, it's actually difficult to say because there was never really that much research suggesting learning styles. It's, it's, I think it's a concept that's sort of arisen more in a popular way. And, and then scientists came in and said, actually, that's not the way it works. So uh, with, with growth mindset, I think there's no harm in applying the growth mindset theory. And th it does work. It does have some effect. Um, however, the, the size of the effect is very small. So you, you need to know that when you're applying it. It's not to think it's going to be some kind of panacea that is suddenly going to lift children up by, you know, three grade points. It's going to be much smaller than that in terms of its actual effect on, on learning. Thanks, Daniel. Um, as we come to the end of this interview, I also want to speak to you regarding what we're seeing during the pandemic. Um, and in particular, like, you know, you've commented about um, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in many respects. Um, and there's a commentary about the use of ed tech tools um, and how we should be thinking about them. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on your views on what we're seeing about the use of technology today? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I think I think we have some great ed tech product out there. You know, a, a lot of it is still needing independent evaluation. I think ed tech and teaching online has has opened uh, opportunities for many people that for whom that was not available. And I, I should say that there's a there's a big part that technology can play in equity if it's managed correctly. I think then we can really get to a global equity in some ways with the availability of educational resources if we work hard. I do have concerns over technology, especially for very young children. I think uh, I think it's very difficult to make that work efficiently and for them to uh, really build relationships with their teachers over the internet. Um, I also have a worry that there could be a lot of commercial interests that are flooding into education and basically are forcing, you know, publicly funded systems hands. So it's all dependent on how we handle it, in my estimation. I think there's some really positive potential effects on especially education past the primary grades, past the elementary school grades. Um, but I think we need to tread carefully. And as a scientist, I would say, you know, let's do the research into what really works online and uh, for what age groups and for which subjects. So I think it's inevitable. This is now such a snowball effect since the since the beginning of the pandemic. So we can't roll it back, but let's roll it out in a really measured and careful way. That would be my, my take on it. So the question I wanted to ask you was with regards to the learning loss that has occurred because of school closures um, uh, in many countries. I'm not just talking about those that have various challenges with infrastructure and devices, but also in very developed nations like mine and yours. Um, you know, so traditionally, and I remember the Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, Outliers, that talked about, you know, how the learning loss that happens during the summer break is so significant that you know, when kids come back, um, you know, it could prove to be an issue. And of course, when you speak to teachers, they talk about how they also recognize that in the first month of kids coming back after a seven week break, they really do press the button and, and accelerate and try to make sure they, they consolidate the, that, that has taken place in the past. Now, beyond the point, um, you know, we're not talking about seven weeks, we're talking almost five months. And so when we think about accelerating or when we look at uh, accelerating or filling the gaps that exist, what would be your advice to teachers in terms of how they can make up? Uh, so in many countries, for example, they're looking at tutoring options uh, over the summer vacation period. Uh, some are talking about other methods. But do you think that the that now grown to many months is too long for teachers to catch up? To play catch up on. Yeah, I think this is going to be incredibly hard for teachers to to deal with. This this fall is going to be hugely challenging. Um, I've seen a lot of teachers on Twitter talking about the importance of um, being compassionate, uh, being uh, paying attention to the equity issues. Uh, you know, we we know from the literature that you cited that in in normal times a summer will exacerbate the inequities between students, right? The students that have resources 
uh, they and, and who have tutors at home, they will be fine when they go back. The others will have had a significant learning loss. Now we've just we've just really that that gap. We've just really stretched that gap really hard, right? So, I think I think there needs to be a lot of compassion. I think we also need to think about whether we're going to keep students in you know this generation of students, this cohort of students, I should say, whether we keep that cohort in, of students in in schools for a year longer to allow them to catch up. Um, what is the, what, but what does the research say? What is the best thing to do, do you think? I, I don't know whether we have research on what, what's the best thing to do with a five-month gap. You know, it's so un, unprecedented in so many ways that I think this is we need to look at now. I think research-wise, we have a potential to look at now. Okay, so if we implement different ways of approaching the new school year, which one work the best, right? I think... That's the only question that we can really ask. I think in terms of the summer gap, it's 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 incredibly difficult. We, we've we never really managed that, right? So yeah. we, we don't really know about this gap either, but I think compassion, seeing where students are at, gradually reintroducing them into this environment that's not just about the knowledge in, but it's also about the social and the personality development. I think those need to be front and center, and then we can gradually, once we've re-established those communities, is make them places of learning again. That would be my take, but that's not really an evidence-based take. That's just sort of what I intuitively feel about how how things uh, might go positively. Thank you, Daniel. And you know, my final question is to do with, you know, what what can teachers do to work with evidence-informed approaches? Uh, and so one of the things I know that you are passionate about is making sure that research is applied in a classroom context. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about your work in this space and, and actually as a sign off uh, to those that are watching this in particular who are teachers, you know, what are the one, two, three things that they can do uh, to, to, to inform their practice? Yeah, thanks. That's, a, that's an excellent question. So I think, um, I think, first of all, we as researchers need to do more to make the resources available to the teachers. That's our job. But teachers uh, have the opportunity to access resources through trusted sources, such as the Institute of Education Sciences, such as the Deans for Impact uh, program in the United States, uh, such as the Nafi Foundation, Educational Endowment Foundation. I think there's some great materials there. Center for Educational Neuroscience at Birkbeck College London as well. Uh, the Learning Scientist is a great website that you can access for principles of learning science as they apply to education. The International Mind, Brain and Education Society is another place where you could look. But also, don't feel uh, uh, shy to approach uh, local professors of psychology and education. Uh, have a chat with them. Use, you know, use your local resources, uh, approach them. Maybe you'll even end up doing an action research project with them and end up co-authoring a scientific publication that furthers your understanding and your classroom practice. So I think there's lots of ways of, of getting in contact. And we're trying to locally build here a science of learning center that is designed to do exactly that, which does and to do outreach, but not just outreach in terms of giving lectures, but also hearing what are teachers' problems and how can we design together evidence-informed approaches to improve the, the education uh, of, of their students. So I think it's it's about collaboration. It's about meeting on an equal playing field. And it's a really also important for researchers such as myself to continually try to reach out, continually try to present our information in a way that's easily consumable in the busy schedules that teachers already have with limited time that they can devote to something like this. So Daniel, uh, lastly, how do people get hold of you? You can uh, reach me uh, by email. Uh, my email is daniel.ansari at uwo.ca. I'm on Twitter at numcog, N-U-M-C-O-G. And uh, if you type into Google numerical cognition, you'll find my uh, numericalcognition.org is my lab's website. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for your time today. I know that um, this half an hour has been enormously useful. And I'm sure that because the content lives online, a lot of people will come and watch this uh, as per their convenience. Uh, but the message that we, I try to bring through this interview and this um, specifically with you was the importance of the learning sciences. And as we, as, as we have discussed, you know, one of the focus areas for the World Education Week that takes place in October 5th to the 9th is to look at schools 
that are actually pursuing you know, uh, action research projects when it comes to the science of learning. Uh, because I think there's some fabulous stuff that we could all learn and actually, you know, inform our pedagogical practice uh, with. Uh, and so you are a leader in that space, and I really thank you for your time today. Um, uh, folks, don't forget that you, this is the last week uh, to apply to take part in the Global sh Showcase for World Education Week. Please visit www.worldeduweek.org. Thank you, and I look forward to receiving your applications for your school. Goodbye.